So welcome back to our second to last session at GABMAC 2021, the Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. And today's presentation is large animal rescue and livestock emergency response training best practices um, presented uh, by Dr. Susan Raymond and Mr. Victor uh, McPherson from the University of Guelph in Canada. Um, so it's a real privilege to have these two experts come and present uh, to the world on their thoughts and um, recommendations around uh, large animal rescue. Um, but before we start today, just some basic housekeeping, you'll find that the Zoom chat function uh, is disabled. Um, but if you do have questions for our uh, presenters today, please use the Q&A um, box, the question and answer box, and we'll come to those towards the end of the session. Um, at the end of today's uh, session, uh, you'll be invited to participate in a short evaluation and we encourage you to do that. And GADMAC uh, is using the hashtag G-A-D-M-C-O-N-F um, across our platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just a reminder that as with all our presentations, they are being recorded. However, they won't be available until uh, July at our awards ceremony. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Susan and Victor to talk about their session today. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, so yes, as we've mentioned, our presentation, uh, I'll say this evening, I know it's this morning for some of you, um, it's on large animal rescue and uh, livestock emergency response training um, in Ontario, Canada. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this conference. And um, we've learned so much from all the presentations that have occurred so far. And are, we're honored to be featured on the last day of the of the conference. Now, lives are both of our um, training programs, both at the University of Guelph, and then also uh, we partnered with Farm and Food Care of Ontario. Uh, we focus on, as we've mentioned, large animal rescue and livestock emergency response training. Uh, the magazine cover that you see on the screen is firefighting Can firefighting in Canada. It's been published for over 60 years, and this is the very first time, and, and to our knowledge, the only time that a livestock or an animal was featured on the cover. And this was our training program um, that uh, occurred in 2014, uh, a TLAR operations level course, uh, where we trained about 35 firefighters. Firefighters, And that poor horse went into and out of that barn about 20 times that day and she was saved every time. So that was great. A little bit of background about us. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're from Ontario, Canada. Um, Ontario is Canada's second largest province, uh, the largest being Quebec. Uh, we cover more than a million square kilometers. Uh, we're home to four out of five of the Great Lakes. Uh, we contain about one-fifth of the world's fresh water. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's evening here and it's also winter. Outside my window is a big pile of snow. Um, Northern Ontario can drop to about uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius in winter. Uh, and then in summers, we can go to above 30 degrees. Uh, we have a really strong agricultural program in Ontario. Um, very diverse types of farming with grain and oilseed farms being most common, uh, followed by livestock with beef cattle production being the highest, followed by dairy, poultry hogs, and other animals, and as well as other farms growing other sorts of crops. We also have a very diverse equine industry. Um, we feature three types of racing with standard bread, which is the, the horses that pull the sulkies behind them. Uh, that's the largest um, number of uh, largest group of racing in Ontario, followed by thoroughbred and quarter horse racing. We also have a very strong um, non-racing industry with both sport horses and then also non-sport or recreational level horses as well. Well, and to give you some little bit of a background, the transportation in Ontario, we in Northern Ontario, we have a highway is called the Trans Canada that goes from one end to the other end. That's allowed us to move our commerce. 
and our product. Northern Ontario is consisted of 807 square, uh, 876, 807,000 square kilometers, about 6% of the population, which is 780,000 people that live in Northern Ontario. It only has three major highways that run through it, which is Highway 11, Highway 17, and Highway 69. So if an event occurred in Northern Ontario, some of the for teams to respond, some of the factors that would be taken into account would be time, weather, life safety, human injury, fatigue, the, the right equipment for livestock needs. Other ones would be the cost factor, resulting in the casualties of human and livestock. For Southern Ontario, we have 17 major highways, which is the 400 series, highways that run through Southern Ontario. It is 140,000 square kilometers, and it's 94% of the population of Ontario is in that area, which is 12.1 million people. There's some of the factors that we deal with on the southern end is weather, traffic congestion, and animals to human injuries that gives you more of exposure, and the cost factor. The cost factor resulting in the casualties of human and livestock which expose more to, for people to interact with. Next. So here, here's a picture of Northern Ontario. Just to give you a little bit of a concept. So our livestock comes in, a lot of livestock comes in from Alberta. And each truck could range uh, with 160 to 820 kilogram animals with a maximum weight of 27,300 kilograms. These animals on the, on the vehicles, they could be 170 beef, or it could be 33, depending on their, depending on their weight. So a little bit of a, a distant wise, the drivers that do these routes are only allowed to drive for 13 hours consecutively, and then you have to have eight hours off. So to put it in perspective, for, for the drivers to reach Alberta, take a load, and then get to Northern Ontario, that's 24 hours drive time but the livestock can only be on the truck for a maximum of 36 hours. We have to be loaded, unloaded for 12 hour consecutive, and then they're reloaded on the vehicle and then travel to Southern Ontario. So if you do the whole run, one run is if the driver in, is in Alberta, picks up a load, Thursday morning of the same week, the truck is being unloaded into Southern Ontario to whatever the destination that would be. So as we can see, livestock, including horses, are transported daily on roadways and highways. As we're aware, transport accidents can be very complex in nature. Uh, they can involve loose, injured, or dead livestock. There's also a human factor in terms of human injury or death. Uh, they can involve multiple, multiple vehicles. And as most of us who work with animals, we know that a distressed animal uh, can behave quite differently than one that we've been feeding every day in the stall. A uh, distressed animal can be very unpredictable and dangerous. Some of the livestock that are being transported per day in Ontario, some examples are poultry. You've got 1.5 billion uh, turkeys, boilers, or chicks that are being delivered per year. Then you calculate that down to that's 30 livestock trailers on the road per day for poultry. Hog, uh, weans, feeder, or finishing, you got approximately 250,000 that are delivered per year. That's 125 uh, livestock trailers on the road per day. For beef that are being moved through Ontario, these are through the sales barn um, numbers, which is 469,740. That's the low end of what it could be. And that's at the light side of the livestock, which is 10 trucks per day. But some of these livestock that are traveling through Ontario could be going to Quebec on the East Coast. And this could be two and three times that amount per day. Uh, the other ones that are traveled livestock that are export to the US is 89,692, which equals to two trailers that are on the road per day. And this does not include the farm to farm local processing. These are all, all, all of these are unknown numbers. So we have to keep, uh, uh, keep this in account that we could have more trailers on the road at certain times. 
And in the mornings, most livestock are being traveled from early morning to late morning to their destinations because of the temperatures. Next. So looking at horse movement in Ontario, as I mentioned earlier, standard bred racing is the, uh, represents the largest number of race horses uh, for Ontario. Um, looking at 2019, there's just under 60,000 horse movements in terms of standard bird racing. Now, the tracks in Ontario, the back stretches are closed, so the horses that come in for racing come in and out the same day. So this doesn't necessarily represent the number of animals, it's the number of times uh, animals have, have moved. Um, and then when, when we, and that would be followed by thoroughbred and quarter horse racing. Uh, when we look at the non-racing section, um, looking at summer times, uh, horses that are traveling on weekends, there's about, there could be 3,000 trailers uh, each weekend on the road. And of course that would represent um, a larger number of horses that could be traveling in the summertime. So you can imagine um, all the, uh, the different range in terms of the types of trailers and also the different expertise or experience in terms of all the drivers um, on the roads in the summertime. Now looking at our both of um, the training programs, both with Equine Guelph and Farm and Food Care Ontario, um, and I think this has been highlighted in a number of the talks at the conference, but we know that responding to incidents involving animals, um, we know that people are gonna put themselves at risk and put others at risk. We know that that's a factor that happens. Um, all large animal incidents, regardless of what the cause is, they represent a risk of injury to responders. So it's our responsibility to make sure that there's proper training and proper use of specialized rescue equipment. In doing so, we significantly mitigate these risks and we improve the odds of a favorable, favorable outcome for both animals and responders. By keeping responders safe, we can improve our capacity to keep animals safe. And as a recent illustration of uh, how people do put themselves at risk for their animals. Um, this is the, the weather situation that's happened recently in Tennessee. Um, Dixon County man dies trying to rescue his calves from a frozen pond. And we know that first responders were involved with this, but this illustrates um, exactly what happens in terms of how people try to respond to animals in need, put themselves at risk, thus putting responders at risk as well. Some of the training that we do for livestock emergency training, it consists of the getting the people out, showing them what the different aspects of the training is, because each department throughout the province has little different response guidelines. So their equipment may be different, their uh, how they respond is different, their training is a little different. So livestock emergency response training provides a hands-on on virtual and makes it an effective form to create a positive change, which creates a knowledge through training and practice and reduces the risks, risks to involve uh, a livestock that are in the incident, so it mitigates the situation. These programs are provided through Equine Guelph, the University of Guelph, and through Ontario Farm and Food Care, which is their best practice and reduce the risk. A little bit of background about Equine Guelph. Um, so we're part of the University of Guelph and we're actually based out of the Ontario Veterinary College. Um, we serve the horses and allied industries through education, training, research, healthcare promotion and industry development. We opened our doors in 2003 and we're supported and overseen by equine industry groups and we're dedicated to improving the health and well-being of horses. So in terms of our education programs, we don't do discipline or breed specific. We look at welfare and well-being of all horses and also looking at the well-being and safety of those that are involved with horses. We have, although in other times we do do some face-to-face -face training, uh, we have a really strong history in online education. Our first course actually started in 2002 before our doors were even open. Um, but we focus on both our longer courses, which are 12 week. Uh, they can be taken to develop into a diploma or a certificate or on their own. And we also have short online courses that are both one week and two week in length. 
We also have a very strong children's program called Equimania. And in other times, we're at a lot of different events and fairs throughout the province. But we've also have um, our Equimania display is duplicated and actually is in the States in Minnesota. Um, and we've also traveled from province to province. Now, we also, especially for these times, we have a very strong online program for kids as well. So looking at our large animal rescue training program, we have, um, for those interested on the horse portal, we have a whole range of hands-on uh, and virtual training resources in terms of reference sheets and videos. Um, like others, we've really ramped up our virtual training. And as I'll mention in the next couple of slides, we really focus on a multidiscipline training approach. We started our program in 2014 and partnering with Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca Eusted of TLAR. With our hands-on training, we've trained over 450 people that have attended our training events. And these have included a number of firefighters, first responders, pre-service, law enforcement, animal control officers and welfare inspectors, uh, large animal veterinarians, vet techs, animal response teams, horse owners, livestock producers, and those associated associations. Looking at our training program, especially our hands-on, and now, as I said, moving into virtual, uh, we really focus on a multidiscipline training approach. Now the core uh, in terms of our training obviously comes from the firefighting profession, um, but we also have a range of other expertise that's behind us. Uh, as because we have such a strong online and hands-on training program for horse owners and industry, um, we're able to draw upon those expertise and, and make use of them in terms of our large animal training. So in addition to the firefighting profession, we also feature in terms of our trainers, um, education profession, educational professionals, uh, look, and, and as well looking at animal physiologists, behaviorists, large animal vets, and livestock welfare inspectors. With our training as well, because we have such a, a history, in addition to large animal rescue training equipment and rescue mannequins, we also have a range of tools that we make use of and we can draw upon these to make a really well-rounded multidiscipline training approach to our programs. The Livestock Emergency Response Training through Farm and Food Care. Farm and Food Care Ontario is a registered charity organization that's a coalition made up of representatives in Ontario of all types of farming and associated businesses and it positions itself to be a helpful expert in Ontario, Ontario agriculture. The common goal is to build public trust and food and food and farming in Ontario across Canada. Next. The, the farm, Ontario Farm and Food Care website, this is an online part. They're very proactive. They have this over there. You can research this, put this on your phone. If you're on the side of the road and you forget what was going on, you can get it very, very easily. And it can be done in refresher training at any time. So it's a proactive and be prepared. First response for first responders, police officers, uh, they're all accustomed to uh, tractor trailer involving uh, motor vehicle accidents. However, involving tractor trailers that are hauling livestock pose a unique challenge and puts them in an unfamiliar territory and dealing with livestock and, or, and with injured animals. By being proactive, you ensure that the team is properly trained to respond and manage the livestock emergencies, including tractor trailer rollovers. Being prepared by knowing what you have access in your area will allow to mitigate the situation faster and help the situation with the livestock for the best practice. And then you see on the bottom there, there's uh, on the website, you can click onto that, that'd be workshops and trainings. And on the right, this is videos. And uh, next slide. The next slide, that's when there, there's your videos. All these videos are online and they are the basics. They're the ones that get you, if you're unfamiliar, or you wanna do a refresher, it's fantastic. You've got handling, livestock handling, 
livestock that it's loose, uh, responding to a livestock incident, um, security of uh, a scene with livestock, they're a great refresher. Next slide. And to enhance those videos, these are uh, resource fact sheets. You can pull them up and they're just a refresher to allow you to understand that, hey, I've had an accident, what do I should be doing? What should I be looking for? Because this is something you don't see every day, but when you do see it, you really know what you have to know what you have to do with these incidents and to make it work for yourselves. And they're all excellent videos for great refreshers. Okay. This uh, video here that's gonna come up, this is uh, uh, all the training that we've put together. So we've broken the training into multiple sections. And first of all, you'd have a size up, then the size up would turn into containment. So you see the firefighters are setting up the containment for the, trans for the livestock. So you wanna maintain security of the scene so the livestock will stay on the truck and you keep them tied in until you have containment set up. This all takes time. While this is being done, you're, you're getting logistics for your veterinarian to come on scene, uh, all your uh, agencies to be there on scene, heavy tow, you're getting your transportation for the livestock that's going to be transported to a nearby farm. Uh, it could be transported to an area where the livestock can be treated for medical if it requires. So the trailer is brought into place and while you bring it in the trailer into place, the, most, the best thing to do for livestock on the scene is to allow them to feed, put their head down and relax, give them a calm environment, and then you allow them to transfer from one to another. And then these smaller trailers are stock trailers. They're smaller, they can only hold so many animals, so you're gonna be doing this multiple times. So you get everything set up. The next shot that you're gonna see is a drone shot of the scene. So before that, we'll, we'll be lowering the door. So now extrication is set up. There's nobody in the containment area. The livestock uh, exits the, the vehicle. So now they're into your staging containment area. Once it, it's all taken place, they all move out. So you're going to have people on top of the vehicle encouraging the livestock to move out. And then you're gonna have people that in the surrounding areas encouraging the livestock to move into the stock trailer. There's a video showing the person on top, everything around, you've got your fire on scene, and then they move into the trailer. And then they'll be extricated, or moved into the trailer and then brought off to an area, farm area. So this is how we've done the training, the hands-on. So it all breaks down into certain parts, even in cutting up the trailer. Next. So looking at our large animal rescue and livestock emergency response training, in summary, we know that there are a large number of animals, livestock and horses that are moved and transported on our highways and roadways. We know that accidents will occur and first responders may be called to assist. In, that, in this way, we know that training is important and that we have to provide uh, training in terms of best practices. Providing this sort of training will help increase the chance of success at a rescue and decrease the risk of injury uh, for both animals and people involved. We have a responsibility to ensure that this training and equipment is made available and doing so allows us to retain our social license to operate in both equine and livestock industries. Education continues to evolve um, in terms of research and development. And we're very proud to be part of a worldwide area in terms of the expertise and um, uh, background in terms of this sort of training. So without further ado, I'd like to also acknowledge the others that are involved with this presentation and this type of training. Uh, we have Bruce Kelly from Farm and Food Care Ontario Dr. Rebecca Gimmon is Eusted from TLR Inc. and Gail Ecker, our Director of Equine Guelph. I want to thank uh, Jim Green from BARDA, the British Animal Rescue and Trauma Care Association, the Horse CA, the Southern Australian Horse Industry, 
and large animal technical rescue training, the College of Veterinarian Medicine, the University of Florida. Thank you. Great, thank you. And um, of course, we're available to answer questions. And those are our websites um, for those of you that want to get further information and of course our email addresses. I know a lot of people are looking forward to this presentation and you've certainly, um, I'm sure many will be very impressed and, and quite excited about what you have presented. Um, as uh, they mentioned, we do have the Q&A up on the display and we do welcome you to um, ask some questions. Um, so please use that facility so we can put some of those questions um, uh, to our presenters today, to Susan and, and Victor. Um, and just maybe just a quick question, what was the, um, um, I may have missed it, but um, what was the main uh, catalyst? Um, what, what sort of inspired you to, to develop this program? Uh, through what, uh, through uh, Equine Guelph? Yeah. Equine Guelph. Um, hmm. I guess the main, I mean, we're, we have a, in terms of Equine Guelph, we have a history, as I said, in education, uh, focusing on um, empowering those that are involved with horses and other livestock to be more proactive in terms of safety and um, fire prevention on their farm. And this, um, it kind of developed into, in addition to training horse people and those involved with livestock to assist with training in terms of the first responders. Um, I was fortunate myself to go down to some training in the States and uh, met with Rebecca and um, we we're fortunate to get some funding to bring her up uh, multiple times. Um, and we'd like to keep bringing her up, uh, but we saw that we recognized the need to train Ontario people uh, so that we can conduct training in a more, um, uh, just on a broader scale. Brilliant, I'm just checking my uh, other questions and notes just to make sure nothing else has come through. Uh, that is looking fantastic. Well, I think you've left, left them speechless. Um, <laughs> normally, we, you've got a huge amount of participants there, but I can't see any any questions. Uh, so unless someone's going to put a question in the next set of five or 10 questions, uh, here we go. This is what we wanted. So do you have a list of the vehicles, equipments, uh, the vehicles and equipment um, that you use when engaging, engaging on some of these, these um, large animal rescues? Um, or, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, in terms of our training, all of our equipment um, is used for only training purposes, but the different fire departments that come on board for training, they can then um, uh, fashion their own uh, equipment and also uh, make use of, we give them the tools to know what they'll, they can use on their truck um, and then what else they can then make use of. Sorry, Victor, you were going to yeah. answer this one as well. Yeah, it's, uh, we give them the websites, uh, the how to make and fashion all this equipment. And uh, we give them the websites to actually purchase it through the US. Some of the suppliers down there in the US do have it that they can purchase. Yes. And we tell what them where it, they can buy it locally. And what about training? Is it available outside of Ontario? Hmm. Um, yes, in terms of virtual, we've been starting up our webinars, which are available for anybody. Uh, on our website, there's um, both Farm and Food Care and Equine Guelph sites. There's tons of resources that are available to, for anyone. Um, in terms of hands-on training, um, we've done uh, training in Ontario, but we're interested in going elsewhere. And I know that obviously uh, uh, Victor has done training also with Rebecca in other provinces as well and, and, and the states as well, obviously. And the, the website you mentioned in the videos, can anyone register for those? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. And yep. are you only training fire departments or are you also training other groups such as veterinary professionals, um, horse clubs, etc.? Yeah, no, we do, we do obviously, yes, a, a very broad-based some of our training is um, uh, is opened up for both firefighting and, and other first responders and then others. 
um, some of the hands-on training we find really valuable to have a very mixed audience um, and then everybody can then see what their proper role should be in, in terms of if an accident occurs. Other times uh, we've done training just specialized for either vet clinics or other specialized groups. And what yeah, about the, like, oh, sorry, go, uh, go ahead, Victor. Sorry. Yeah, for instance, we did training for the specialized mounted units in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And mm -hmm. what about for some of the, the stock trucks that are going for longer drives across the country? Some of those, uh, those trucking companies tend to use multiple drivers. Um, so how does that present in terms of trying to train companies which have multiple drivers or animals being unloaded and loaded throughout that sort of journey. Um, are there any considerations for that? For in the livestock, my exposure with uh, the, the folks that I've been work, working with, uh, the one driver, he will stay with his vehicle and do the driving from point A to point B. And then the, when they deliver the, the animals to wherever the destination is, the, the vehicle is clean top to bottom. There's, they're very well maintained and taken care of. Uh, for switching drivers, I haven't seen that. I, I don't know if anybody's doing that, but it's, it could be possible, yes. And when calling in resources, both equipment and human, how far afield should responders be looking? In other words, what do you think is a reasonable wait time for resources to arrive? So if people are putting together a plan, how, far, how further afield should they identify resources? They should, they should stick within their closest, closest as possible to where their, their geographical areas, like they have their call the response guide. So they're only governed by their boundaries. Uh, Northern Ontario, it's, it's wide open. It, it's very distant and it's very hard to get equipment there because there's very little people and it's costly. And the fire departments in Northern Ontario are districts. So they're trained to the minimum of life safety and auto extrication, but uh, the animal rescue is on top of that. Um, the, the one thing I've found in this training is the driver's network is fantastic between both uh, poultry, beef and uh, pork. They know each other, they know their routes, they know who they can call, they have friends. And then they have, uh, we do have uh, phone numbers through the poultry industry which has response trailers and in Alberta they have a set up of response trailers for this. And um, some of the fire departments also may go to incidents in, in involving um, ag aggressive animals such as dogs etc. I know this is a rather a small animal rather than a large animal um, but does the university provide any training for, for those um, other kinds of animal interactions? We have been providing training in terms of um, all the different livestock commodity groups, especially to the animal welfare inspectors. Um, we do have, um, not to my knowledge though, in terms of dogs, um, but uh, it, it, we do have the expertise behind us that um, if groups were to contact us, we could put something together, but uh, mainly it's, uh, we have done a history to livestock welfare inspectors and introducing them to all the different uh, types of livestock and, and horses as well. Brilliant. And um, Howard's got a, um, just a, a note here saying that the livestockwelfare.com, um, is that the correct site for your videos? He was just trying to uh, log on there and the site uh, listed did not link to that website. The farm and food care YouTube site doesn't link up. So there may be some linking issues there that you may want to um, look at potentially. Um, mm -hmm. And another com comment is uh, from, from Jody, and she's saying, great, it's you're, you're allowing this course to be available uh, all over the place and outside the US. Um, but she highlights some of the confusion or, or, or under misunderstandings around terminologies. So will you have a glossary available um, to, to assist? So for example, um, bumper haul, horse float, tractor, prime mover, um, <laughs> yeah. those kinds of terms. Yeah. There's only so um, much we can ask you to do, but... Um. 
It's, it's, it's true, though. I mean, even within our own uh, province in terms of the different professionals, I mean, when you have a bunch of first responders and horse people together and we say, you know, something like uh, cribbing and uh, that represents a difference uh, in terms of for horse people versus first responders. But yeah, we should um, definitely have uh, a dictionary available. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mammoth task in itself. Um, mm -hmm. And what about um, wild large animals such as feral horses or cattle? How, is there a program that, that caters for that? Uh, we haven't um, worked too much on wild. Go ahead, Victor. Uh, if it's uh, wild or feral in, in the public format, then it's a policing matter. Under the PAWS Act, then it turns into a police matter. For training against that, that's um, like we're dealing with livestock that's had, uh, like on, uh, Alberta beef has had very little human contact. So you have to be very careful with it. But mind you, you have to be very careful with all livestock. But the uh, livestock that could be transferred, uh, delivered in southern Ontario, has more of a human contact. So it's less likely to pose uh, an issue unless it's in a fight or flight mode that it's been in an incident. And then it's a whole different ball game until it calms down. Well, I'm glad we got a good round of questions in towards the end. They started to flow quite nicely. Um, so do you have any final comments before we, we thank you for what has been a fascinating presentation? Um, I guess final comments. I mean, again, thank you for letting us be a part of this conference. I've, I've learned so much. And uh, please, you know, reach out to us in terms of our websites and our email addresses as well. And thank you. I say the same thing. Thank you very much. Excellent job on the, on the conference. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Susan and Victor, thank you very much for giving up your time being part of GABMAC 2021. And we look forward to you being part of future conferences as well. So thanks everyone for joining us today. That's our second to last presentation for GABMAC 2021. Our next session uh, is in so many hours. Uh, it's about four, uh, four hours and 20 minutes away. Um, and the penultimate uh, presentation is with uh, Jennifer Gardner and Nicole rogers Murren. Um, who will be talking about evacuation planning guidelines for wildlife groups and carers, uh, and they're from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And immediately following that, we'll have the wrap up for the conference. So we're nearly there. Thank you very much. And we look forward to um, seeing you there for that final session. Have a great day. Thank you.